I'd like to call the um, Lancaster City Planning Commission meeting on Wednesday, August 17th to order. Time is currently 6.01 p.m. Uh, moving on. Our first item up on the agenda is the approval of the meeting minutes of July 20th, 2022. Is there any discussion? Uh, mo yes, motion, second, and then discussion. I move that we approve the minutes of the meeting of July 20th, 2022. And I second that motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to back up for, uh, let me call that. Actually, we'll go through and um, vote on those meetings, meeting minutes. Um, but uh, before I do that, I want to just make a motion or just make a note that um, Mr. Bohm um, is a alternate member that's serving as um, a voting member this evening, as well as uh, Mr. Dastra, both of which are alternate members that will be voting tonight. And Madam Chair, um, thank you for that note. And if you don't mind, uh, can we also just appoint a, temporarily for this meeting a formal chair in the absence of the chair and vice chair? Um, I think the commission is interested in having you serve. <laughs> I move in uh, so that Nicole Schiffert be the chair for this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. You guys are in for a ride tonight. <laughs> All right. So we have the meeting minutes approved. I'm sorry. Um, all in favor of the motion of the approval of the meeting minutes for July 20th, 2022. Let's just start this over, please. Can I please have a motion? Uh, I move that we approve the meeting minutes Thank you. of July 20th, 2022. How about a second? And I second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Moving on. We'll go into our um, agenda item number three, the subdivision and land development. Uh, we have a planning commission waiver of preliminary plan application for um, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design student housing project at 223 North Water Street. Um, so Madam Chair, uh, this is a project that um, we're currently uh, reviewing for land development and many of the final land development plans that um, come before the commission have gone through a sketch plan process and that is typically what allows them to proceed directly to final plan without preliminary plan. Uh, in this case we did not go through a full sketch plan uh, process with this uh, applicant. Um, the land development plan um, as you might hear a little bit more about is um, fairly straightforward in this case and uh, city staff believes that it's not um, does not warrant a preliminary plan. Um, however, it does exceed um, one of the thresholds for a preliminary plan, and that's uh, one of those requirements is a sewer module um, be processed for the project, um, which has been done because of the increase in sewer capacity that's needed um, to serve the project. Um, and just as a reminder, um, this is a land development plan for the conversion of the former Chameleon Club um, to about 43 individual um, bedroom units, or really it's student housing, um, for or the Pennsylvania um, College of Art and Design. So uh, city staff is recommending that there be a waiver of uh, pre preliminary plan approval. Um, I know the designer from um, uh, the team, uh, the development team is here this evening if we have any questions of him as well. And uh, would you like to offer some words as well? Yes, I would. Uh, I oh, sorry, do you mind uh, hitting the button on the microphone? It should turn red. Is that on now? Yes, thank you. I'm Eldon Stoltz, who's the architect for the project, <clears throat> and uh, Matt couldn't be here tonight. He did think it was more appropriate that I be here since all we're doing is re replacing a sidewalk and planting a tree in terms of land development, so that he thought it was more appropriate if, I, if I'm here. Um, basically, the, the community club will be converted to student housing. There's actually 25 units, and that's what kicked us into uh, land development. There's 25 units plus the plus the sewer module um, kicked us into land development. Um, the, of the 25 units, some of those are two bedroom. So there will be, there will be uh, upwards of 55 students in the facility, residing in the facility. The lower level is classrooms and studios for the college, for uh, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Um, the, the, the main addition that we're doing is making it accessible, putting an elevator in. And on the third floor where the roof deck was for the community club, we're adding a, a unit there. Uh, it's also kind of a connection between the elevator and the, and the main part of the building. 
we do have zoning approval and we also have uh, HARB we, we met with HARB and they give us their recommendation for approval as well any other questions on the project um, thank you for clarifying that you're exceeding the 40 unit threshold as well so that's actually the second provision of um, the preliminary plan waiver that's exceeded in this case um, this is an administrative list basically that we can administer without planning commission but in this case because they exceed the 40 unit threshold and they also are exceeding the sewer planning module threshold um, we're bringing it before the commission with a recommendation for approval um, so uh, I guess with that, any discussion from the commission and then we can move to a public comment after that. Mr. Smith, uh, so we will see this again then? Yes, um, yes you will. So they'll come back for a final plan approval in the coming months. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, Mr. Smith, um, what is the, I don't want to say reasoning, of going just over the 40 by having the 43? Is there anything in particular, or is it just how it's designed? Again, I'm not sh clear on the number of units and how it was specified, but we have we have 25 bedroom um, bedroom units in the building, uh, which will house 55 students. The way that the I'm not real clear on how it was determined there were 43 individual units, but um, we, we need that population in order to make this project feasible. We need the population of 55 students in that facility. Currently, the students are living in other buildings in the city, um, and they would really like to bring them in closer to the college and have a, a facility where they can add some classroom space. Um, we, we didn't put student housing on the first floor in the front, which would be on Prince Street, we'd be level with Prince Street. We were allowing for a small commercial space there. And then the classroom, that what is now the, the large two-story space that was the Chameleon Club main uh, facility, they're gonna use that as a classroom and studio. Um, but in order to make it a viable project, we need to get 55 students in there. Okay, thank you. Where are the students parking? The parking is, as I understand it, in the garage right across the street, if there is parking. Most Great. of the students do not drive. And we're also parking all their bicycles inside the building. So there's a, there's a bicycle rack inside the building for them. That was my next question. Where are the bikes going? Yeah. Glad to hear that there's bike parking. Uh, do we? Just because we are asking some questions, do we happen to have any preliminary drawings of what's going? Uh, well, we do, um, and we can, if the commission would really like to see them, we can pull them up. Um, the disclaimer there is uh, because the building footprint is not changing, it's a fully built out site. It stretches from Prince to Water Street, um, if you're familiar with the Chameleon Building, uh, Chameleon Club formerly. The only thing that's being done is a replacement of sidewalk and a planting of one street tree. Um, there's really there's nothing else that's happening as part of the land development except that. So it's a rather unexciting plan given that there's no new building or anything. Uh, but certainly, um, if the if the commission has questions about what's in, in the plan, we can pull it up. Uh, again, this will come back to you as a final plan approval um, in the coming months after we finish our review at the staff level. Okay. The, the only reason I ask is because um, I think the, there's a few things I'm curious about, but I'm sure we'll talk about those at the final review. I'm just curious right now which side um, the commercial space is going to be on, if that's going to be on the Water Street side or the Queen Street side. Be on the Prince Street side and oh, it will be only on the north section of the, the building is actually made up of two sections uh, and it will be on the north side of that front um, building. They're, they're allowing us the space that goes into that main, uh, it used to be an auditorium, I guess where the, most of the music events happen. I've never been there for one of those, but I hear it was pretty exciting. Uh, <laughs> where, where, they, where that space is, they're allowing the front area so students could enter through that into that space without having to go through the entire building. 
So okay. on the south side of Prince Street, that will be, which is the, the facade that has the, the faux stone, uh, that will be the side where they'll use that as a preamble room for that, for that large classroom space. But on the right side, which currently has the red canopy, the commercial space will be on the right side of that. Okay, and then I think this is the last question I have. Is there going to be any facade restoration work done to like remove the stone at all? We certainly would like to. Um, okay. If you go out now, there's a test that was done, and it's going to damage the brick, unfortunately. But we're going to try to find someone who can take off that stone and, and refurbish the brick. It's not required by HARB. HARB, the only right. review they had was the, the addition that we're doing on Water Street, but they appreciated the fact that we're trying to bring that front of the building back up to uh, nicer standards. Okay, great, thank you. And since you did mention the addition, I'll just clarify, there, there's a portion on, I think it's the third floor, where there's kind of a notch out in the building, and the college is proposing to just expand the, that top floor into that notched area. So there's no new building footprint, there's no new structure, really. It's just a small addition on one of the upper floors on the rear side, on um, the Water Street side. And it's visible from the public right of way, which required the historical commission approval. I can say if I was a student there, I would be very excited about that location. So I look forward to seeing the final plans when you guys are done. Yeah, we're really happy we can refurbish this building for use in the arts. I mean, I think it's just a real appropriate use for that building. I don't know. The chameleon was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was. But I guess they didn't make it through COVID. I'm not sure what the story is. Is there any further discussion from the Planning Commission? Uh, you can, um, well, certainly we should invite the public up first, and then uh, you can you can call for a motion if you'd like, first and second, and there can be any additional discussion. We've kind of already done the discussion ahead of time, but that's all right, yeah. Okay, but, so how about it? Do I have a motion for the waiver of the preliminary plan for the application of PCAT at student housing at 223 North Water Street? Yes, I would like to make a motion to waive the preliminary plan application for PCAT student housing at 223 North Water Street. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you. Um, with that being said, is there any discussion from the public this evening? Okay. So with that, we'll call this uh, to a formal vote. Uh, Mr. Whelan? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Baum? Aye. Mr. Drasta? Aye. Uh, you can motion, say motion, motion carries. Yeah, motion carries. <laughs> motion carries. We're going to move on with the agenda. Thank you um, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, up next, uh, we have a sketch plan presentation for 347 North Queen Street. Um, we uh, will not be taking a motion on this this evening, so I welcome the presenters up to the podium. I'm Gary Weaver, Weaver with Tippett's Weaver Architects. I'm the architect for this project, uh, 347 North Queen Street. With me tonight... Excuse me, Mr. Weaver. Can you ensure that the microphone is on and speak a little bit louder into it so the folks on the uh, online services can hear us as well? Got it, got it. Thank you. Okay. Do I need to start over? You're good. <laughs> uh, with me tonight is uh, the developer of the project, Matthew Richard, back here, and also Cheryl Love with ELA, who's handling the a civil and land development portion of the project. And so we're gonna kind of go through a quick introduction to the project and overview. This is kind of an abbreviated version of what was presented to the Historical Commission, uh, just to give you an overview of the project. So I'll take care of that, and then I think Cheryl's gonna take care of any of the land development issues, and then we can address any questions that you might have. So um, to start with, um, the first uh, slide that I have up here just shows the aerial of the site. This area right in here is the project site, which is the corner of uh, Lemon and North Queen. It's directly diagonal across from the Belvedere. Uh, this 
site. Uh, it was actually part of a larger uh, condominium project that was done, I think it was started around 2008, 2009, called Northgate. Northgate included these townhouse properties that are here on Lemon Street. It included the renovation of this warehouse structure back in here, and then also these properties that are along North Queen Street. So can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, this is an area view looking down at the site. Again, the site that we're dealing with is this portion right here, North Queen Street in this location, Lemon Street coming across here. The rest of the Northgate project is this area that's kind of right there. This parcel was separated out from the rest of the condominium, so it's a separate parcel at this point. Uh, it's about 105 feet in one direction, I think 110 feet in the other direction. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, just a couple of aerial views that we're showing in here. When we were presenting before, um, we did a conceptual review with the Historic Commission in April. Uh, one of the things we were concerned about at that time is really talking about the massing and the scale of the building. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. This gives you sort of context. The yellow block that's in the center here kind of gives you some idea of the rough massing of the uh, project that we're proposing. We did identify a number of other projects that are uh, within that area uh, that are obviously identified by the numbers ranging between six and 12 stories. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is obviously, that was looking south, this is looking north, and again, the project is right here, kind of a rough idea of the size of the building tucked in right there. And again, as you go north from there, you can see um, there are a considerable number of larger buildings, largely the um, hospital buildings and some others um, on the kind of west of the site. These are some photographs that just show the existing site. And so you can see from Lemon Street up here, what's on the site right now is surface parking, a little ticket booth that's there. And then down below on North Queen, again, um, the edge of the North Gate project is here. And then over here, you can see the townhouses beyond. Next slide, please. Uh, usually, um, our office likes to do these sort of um, sort of collage uh, elevations to kind of look at the context that we're dealing with. And so we really outlined all of uh, this block of North Queen right here. And this would be Lemon Street at this location. And as we turn the corner, this is the Lemon Street elevation up here. Uh, we oftentimes look at these just to try and understand the patterns of the street, the scale, and that sort of thing. Um, some of the things that we were looking at in this particular diagram were the modules of the street, because obviously the city of Lancaster developed in these modules, sometimes in a row house width that might have been 20 feet wide or something like that. And as you get into closer to the center of town, the modules get wider. So we're starting to look at that. The other thing that we'll note on this is at this level, you can see we sort of identified this, pretty much this entire block as a storefront uh, that's essentially 14 feet to 16 feet high. It extends pretty much the entire way along North Queen Street. Um, we're proposing that it might turn the corner, which is pretty typical of the way many of the commercial uh, strips are as they then turn into more residential areas. I'm going to jump into the plans and kind of walk through the plans. Um, this is the first floor of the building. Again, North Queen is over here. Lemon Street across the top. There's currently an <coughs> entrance off of Lemon Street that's right here, which we're going to maintain. The back portion of the site, we're doing surface parking at this point, which will be under the building. Um, the other functions that we have on this first floor level are along um, Queen Street. We have a couple commercial spaces, a corner space, which we think could be a cafe, possibly a small restaurant. We have another space here that may be a fitness center. Um, the upper floors of the building will be all residential units. And so we have floors um, two through seven which are residential um, rentals. Um, we, we have everything from studios, which are about 450 square feet, up to uh, one, the largest one bedroom is the one that's on the corner, which is about 800 square feet. Everything's arranged around, if we go back. <laughs> um, everything's arranged around this sort of corridor that goes through the center, and then vertical cores that go up through. And then to the top floor, we have, on the top floor, we have a roof deck. Uh, where these vertical pieces come up through. Uh, the roof deck is kind of taking on a different configuration at this point, but it will be a piece that's on the roof up in here. Much of the rest of the roof that's not covered by mechanical units and roof deck will be green roof. 
And you can see this area in the back here is kind of notched out, and that's open to down below. Next slide, please. And so then we have a couple um, quick conceptual studies. These were the early versions of what the building uh, might look like. Um, again, you can see at the lowest level, we have a storefront, largely glass, a canopy piece that sort of makes the entrance at the corner. Um, we are thinking that the bulk of the elevations that face uh, North Queen and Lemon Street will be a masonry veneer. And as we get up on the building, we're sort of breaking down the massing by making some changes in material at the top and sort of carrying a cornice line so the building starts to step down as it comes uh, into the rest of the block. This is the elevation on Lemon Street. Next slide, please. And then the rear elevation, this is actually from the south elevation. So this would be as you're coming up North Queen Street. North Queen would be this location over here. Uh, this portion of the building extends above the Northgate properties. We do have a kind of end elevation here where we thought we might end up with a painted, uh, some sort of graphic or some sort of, um, originally the idea was some sort of graphic that um, made reference to some of the historical graphics that we'd see on end elevations, of painted uh, end elevations that we saw in, in the city of Lancaster. And then this is the uh, elevation to the east and then the final view that we have is just a, a, an initial rendering of um, what it might look like from if we're standing in front of the Belvedere looking across the street. So we will be going back to the Historical Commission. At this point, I think we're scheduled. We think we're going to be scheduled for October for that final presentation uh, to get back to Historical Commission. Uh, good evening, Cheryl Love with ELA Group. Um, with regards to the site, uh, the existing site is on the screen. As Gary mentioned, uh, the width, the total property area is um, approximately 0.26 uh, acres. Um, so it's it, there's a red boundary around it on the screen. Um, there are a number of existing stormwater um, connections and pipes that are conveyed through the site currently. These are downspouts from the adjacent building underground um, into that existing inlet, as well as taking on some stormwater facilities through current easements uh, from the property just immediately east. And all of those are conveyed out to uh, Lemon Street. Um, we are actually rerouting some of those internal of our property, uh, but essentially the same exit point would be maintained and we've been working uh, with city staff, uh, Brian Harner and others in stormwater department with regards to that location uh, for utilities. Um, as this is on the screen, um, we would be seeking to remove the two street trees along Queen as well as the two smaller trees along Lemon in order to facilitate um, the proper spacing and addition of what we'll see later on a plan here uh, with eight overall total street trees every 25 feet on center as is required. Um, there is an existing access point at the rear as an emergency that is gated and we would look to maintain um, that gate situation as well. So this current plan um, existing does show two separated um, entrance and exits uh, with the ticket booth that Gary had shared uh, in the photos. Our drive would essentially be in that same location, but it would actually be narrowed and condensed into one driveway in and out, which you'll see here in a second. Um, so this is a, a view of the layout plan. Uh, from a coloration standpoint, the dark building is what's physically at ground level. Um, the lighter gray shade depicts the remaining floor levels above. So from second through seventh story, that footprint is the entirety, but we wanted to focus and make sure it was understood uh, the exact um, portions that were at ground level itself. And as Gary had noted, this was the area that's open airspace above. Um, a couple other key points, we would be uh, providing proper brick banding and sidewalks along all sides of this uh, frontage. Uh, those are new street tree openings with structural soil shading behind and, and proper sidewalks and whatnot. Um, and then from an ADA standpoint, 
Although parking is not technically required, um, we are electing to provide a total of 18. That includes one van accessible ADA space, which is located here with a proper van width aisle uh, that is um, able to bring all residents can enter through this uh, door into the lobby space and then uh, the elevator space and stair towers to the floors above are, are immediately there. There's a package room at the front um, that allows through these doors some access to be controlled for package delivery from Queen Street. Um, there's a requirement for bicycle parking. We've calculated that based on numbers of residential rooms and the bicycles are all um, contained within the building and there's some resident storage space there as well. So they'll all be secured as well as being under roof and, um, and met inside the building itself. Um, a few more other areas, mechanical space and whatnot are at the ground floor level there. So we're looking on this plan gives you a little bit of an idea of um, similar uh, depiction of the building itself, but a little bit more with where we're heading with our stormwater piping and whatnot. So we would pick up the piping that was previously coming into the site and out. Um, we would route that inside of our site, but hug the perimeter of our, of our site with the piping. So we would convey the current roof drainage that's in those pipes underground um, through and we would also pick up with another stormwater structure the piping at property line um, that that is conveying some of the offsite all of that offsite would be conveyed around and then into a new inlet that is dropped in the location of where the current piping was exiting our site out to the same uh, system in in lemon street from a stormwater um, facility standpoint, we've looked at um, infiltration testing. We're working very tightly with the geotechnical company that provided the testing. We are able to infiltrate in this zone that's dashed uh, green in the back portion. So we have an infiltrating um, stormwater system underground at that location. The rest of the pieces that you see here are um, actually solid capped, but we have another underground uh, storage facility that does not infiltrate, but it is storing volume and capacity of water uh, in this green zone here. And then all of that that we've managed um, ultimately joins and exits out to, to Queen, or I'm sorry, to Lemon Street. Um, as Gary noted, he did share the, the roof plan from his earlier drawing. Um, this drawing depicts more of the streetscape itself, but from a stormwater standpoint, approximately the northern third of this rooftop level right now is also envisioned as a green roof. We've been running through calculations with that. And um, the combination of these various stormwater facilities, we are actually able to get very close to uh, what the ordinance requirements are from a stormwater standpoint. So we've pushed very hard on this to maximize every space we can in in working towards meeting those parameters. So there's some of the nuts and bolts of um, the site plan itself. Other utilities, uh, we've worked already with staff, um, again, Brian Harner and Ben Perry when, from sewer and water departments. Those connections would be um, through the northern portion out to those uh, systems that exist in Lemon Street as well. Um, we've received capacity approvals for those items currently, and we have our sewer module at the city and at the county uh, working through their review processes prior to going to DEP. Um, from a streetscape standpoint, um, we have proposed these eight trees. Uh, I believe we are short uh, one or so that would be a fee in lieu of. We have received city staff's comments um, on the sketch plan and we're working our way through those and fine tuning those as we move towards engineering a final plan. Uh, there are some good comments, um, provide some more clearance and shift these trees approximately 10 feet from drive opening to the left on each side just to help improve the workability and the, the tree canopies. 
um, you can see this zone here is the narrowed um, driveway in and out um, but it's essentially in the similar location as the the current driveway but although it's being narrowed uh, that will go through traffic commission approval as well um, I think I hit most of the immediate key points uh, that we were looking to touch on and um, we will continue to address the city's various comments um, that we have received to date um, both architecturally as well as from a site plan standpoint. Um, anything else, Gary or Matthew? Other than that, we'd open to questions um, from the Planning Commission. Mr. Smith, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, I, I do have some questions um, for the applicant, but uh, I'll just start off by saying, just as a reminder, this is part of the sketch plan process that leads us towards a preliminary plan waiver. Um, they've met the requirements of the sketch plan submission, um, and we do have uh, a comment letter um, to them. Um, a couple of questions. Thank you for the detailed presentation. Um, the this is the first maybe the first stormwater system that I've seen underneath a building I don't know there might have, I think that I've looked at so I can you just give a little bit of context around that why yes. is that happening what yes. is unusual about it what is safe about it um, right. since it's under a foundation yeah Mandalee can you go back to the one plan back I think where the that that's perfect uh, oops forward one please where the green outlines are dashed it might be easier to look at um, we've worked very closely with the geotechnical company, uh, the structural engineers, and the architectural team um, to understand the, the geology and what the soils have in this location. Um, the only area where we truly can do some infiltrating, again, it's not really underbuilding. We are, so I want to make sure I'm clear in how I present that this zone in the back this small square um, is under pavement of parking just like any other outside uh, stormwater infiltrating facility would be so the building itself and its its structural components are not in this immediate vicinity in fact we're maintaining the recommended clearances from any of the uh, building piers and the foundation systems um, from the structure itself what you see here is true watertight storage of stormwater itself. So it's an enclosed, completely watertight system. And that is simply to over attenuate and to hold and control the stormwater volumes and capacities and then release that at the acceptable uh, rates out into the storms system in order to work towards meeting the stormwater ordinance. So it's a completely self-contained watertight system um, that's truly under the building and it has clearances as well from all of the structural components. How much um, water is that system able to um, manage? Is it the whole entire building and all the runoff from that? Combination of three different things. So the infiltrating yes that that helps to meet portion of it the piping system here is watertight controlled and and holding back the stormwater and then if you imagine we didn't draw the green line on because it's getting a little confusing but the top one third of this roof is green roof and we've looked at various systems different media depths and plantings uh, for that so those combinations are what is controlling our stormwater and getting us extremely close to meeting the ordinance requirements that we need to for stormwater for the project. Um, the remaining stormwater that I first described, oh. this other piping system is simply conveying what was already being conveyed from offsite around our facilities and out to the same piping system as it is currently happening. Um, we don't have the ability to pull any offsite stormwater into our systems and control theirs as well. So we're simply continuing that flow as it currently exists, but we are controlling ours through those three different components. So all of the roof water as it leaves the green roof and the building systems itself would be conveyed 
first into our infiltration system and then as anything is not able to be managed there it flows into the storage the watertight storage and then all of those three pieces together allow us to meet what's um, extremely close to meeting what the city's requirements are what's the maximum capacity or, or I guess um, you know if we have an extreme weather continues to be more and more extreme stormwater continues mm -hmm. to be a, a huge pollution contributor into our Conestoga and our Susquehanna rivers which are also community assets we want to keep those waters mm -hmm. safe and healthy right um, our city unfortunately has a combined sewer system that right. has big problems and 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 adds to those pollution challenges we're not the only city in our region right. that does that so I'm just 72 a 72 seven story building is a big building and I know that it's already um, primarily um, pervious surface is that right as a pervious it would be impervious impermeable thank you impermeable <laughs> um, so uh, my concern is with the the extreme rainfalls that we've been having and the stormwater systems that you're saying and, and the fact that you're you're just noting that you're almost there you're almost there I'd really like to see us over and and then take into consideration some of those bigger um, rainfalls and those storm systems to see how can we and what can this project do in order to help those waters later down the stream stay a little bit cleaner understand understand Hi, uh, I'm Matt Richards. I'm the developer. Um, I just wanted to um, address something that I think um, may not be entirely clear, but we are um, improving the stormwater system versus what is existing now. So this is not adding anything that isn't already in the system. We are actually removed. We are over retaining and removing water, and it should result in a better system for the city as designed currently. Yeah, I might add to that. Um we are also working with Brian Harner and um, have clarified some of his notations within our sewer capacity letter. Um, when I say we're almost meeting, we're meeting from a volume type of control. There's very technical things related to loading ratios and things that relate to water quality that are extremely difficult in the city itself to truly meet all of those little parameters. Um, but we are also accepting on some additional controls that are above and beyond the ordinance requirement as they relate to removing portions of some additional stormwater flow in order to compensate for the increased sewer capacity at our site. So if you picture it, sewer and stormwater going into that system, so our increase to our sewer is also being controlled into our stormwater systems themselves to take that load off of uh, that additional load off of the combined sewer, sewer storm systems that are out front. I understand where your where your concern is, but um, stormwater is extremely technical, um, and and Douglas and and Mandalay listen to our our uh, our detailed calculations and presentations are well reviewed every time we submit. Um, <clears throat> we are really over detaining based on on where we are but there's loading ratios and a few other technicalities that are extremely difficult to meet in this in the city to to the latter of that small portion of the ordinance I don't know Douglas am I explaining that in any better way I think you're, you're doing a good job of that um, yeah. we basically don't let anyone off the hook when it comes yeah. to storm water yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I really do appreciate the questions and uh, certainly going above and beyond in any ways that we can um, is you know, better for, for the, our, our river systems. Um, I did have a couple other questions just about the building footprint. I wanna make sure I understand why certain decisions were made there. Um, on in the, the northeast corner of the building, it's pulled back just a little bit and there's some parking spaces it looks like that are exposed there. Um, is this a building code decision because of setback for openings or how did that little tooth get taken out there? It is not a building code issue uh, necessarily, although we did pull it back so we can get some windows in that elevation. And so if that actually ran right up to the property line, we would not be able to have windows on that east elevation. Also in that notch, there's a window on the north elevation that goes into a unit that um, is arranged on the kind of back side of the building. And so that also gets a window into that unit as well. And so it was about getting natural light into those two, two units. Okay. 
Got it. I, I figured that was the case there. And then my other question is about the southeast portion of the lot. Um, did you say that gated driveway access would remain? Yeah. Okay. And just curious, what is the, the relationship or the, uh, that's going on there? Is this um, another exit out of the property, or is there a tenant there that's accessing those parking spaces? What What is the purpose of the gate and the connection? So, I'm going to try to address this. So um, there has always been a gate there. Yeah. There is a recorded easement of some sort, which is very unclear, that talks about um, emergency access. And so we did a, a little bit of research on that to try and figure out where that came about and what that was, what initiated it, what it really meant. And so we've had a number of meetings with the building code and also the fire bureau. And at this point, what we've gotten from the fire chief, uh, fire chief uh, Hutchinson, is that um, they do need a way to get an aerial apparatus vehicle into the site so that they could access the building behind this building, which would be part of the Northgate project. Um, what that means when you read the fire code is there's a limitation on minimum height and also width to be able to get that apparatus in. We actually raised the first floor height of the building up to 16 feet floor to floor to make sure that we can provide that access through the building. Uh, it, it meets the requirements for a dead end access. Um, I suppose you could open the gate and go through at that point, although maneuverability probably inside the site becomes difficult at that point. So, okay. It is, not, it is not meant to be an access point for vehicles to either go from our property to the Northgate property or from the Northgate property to go to our property unless it's an emergency okay. situation. Got it. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, I might want to dig into that a little bit more another time. Um, Certainly, I would recommend that any encumbrances on the property, deeds, easement, uh, easements, et cetera, be represented on the plans just so we can be working with a full set of information um, there. Um, but appreciate that explanation for now. I want to circle back a little bit to make sure I understand the stormwater situation. So I'm understanding that the system is being improved. Um, you had mentioned that like this is going to handle everything a a any stormwater concerns it's it's doing the satisfactory job um but it, did you say that it's not going to handle like anything uh I, I don't know if anything additional is the way i want to say it but as um the chair had mentioned uh storm storms are getting worse yeah. we from a volume, from a capacity, from an infiltration, I mean, we're meeting the ordinance in those design parameters and with the way that the various different storm events that are required to be calculated for stormwater in the ordinance, we are meeting those. Um, and the offsite is, as I explained, that's conveying through. I, I don't think there should be uh, any issues with that from what we understand. It's, we're, we are, continuing that in its same general configuration as what's happening now um, okay. so, so through the site. It's just we cannot take the other off-site stormwaters and manage their stormwater as well. So we're keeping it as a separate system. So this piping is an enclosed piping system, um, and these are simply squares for access points. They're solid lids. They're not accepting any of our stormwater our stormwater flows in and gets managed in our own space, but it's simply a routing of taking the pipes that on our existing plan went like this to an existing inlet and went out. Right. It's 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 changing the direction of flow. So all the offsite that went through our site is still being conveyed through, but in a different direction. Got so yeah. every all the offsite stormwater that's currently being managed by the property is being handled just in a different way and um, right. everything that is necessary for the project right. is being handled in a separate system. Okay. Right, correct. Um, the, so my question is have the, uh, I actually saw in Philadelphia that there's like some tree wells, for example, that are all interconnected and they're able to retain uh, certain volumes of stormwater. Has there been any consideration to do that with these tree wells? We have, um, we have, 
proposed that idea to the city on other projects, um, other similar projects that I've had. I understand, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the city, but I believe that um, there are opportunities for that that are under consideration. However, those areas are in the street right of way. That's where the street trees are required. So it gets a little murky for us to convey any of our stormwater into the city's right of way when it's our storm infrastructure we should be managing in our site itself. So um, even though we understand there's a benefit there, um, as things move forward and you know things continue to improve with ordinances and, and other things, maybe there's opportunity there. I think um, it's something we, we pushed pretty hard on on a previous project and um, we eventually went a different direction. Um, but we understand that that is something that um, staff at the city is is considering and looking into. Am I right, Douglas? On that? Yes, definitely. We're trying to encourage the use of more trees as green infrastructure. Um, that we just need to be uh, we need, they need to be defensible calculations for the EPA, which is um, overseeing our every move in the city because of our stormwater uh, issue. Um, I do have. Uh, Couple other questions here. I noticed that there's a stormwater easement that already runs through the property. Is that right underneath the garage? And I'm just wondering if you can speak to whether that's going to continue to we, exist. We will. We will need to change that. Like okay. if, if Mandela, if you wanted to scoot back to the existing. And is that an I easement uh, for the city's access to the existing system, or who is the easement benefiting? Um. And you know, the ultimately, the question is: Does the building construction over top of it? You know, prohibit the easement. Easement does that need to be extinguished? The existing stormwater easement is part of the Northgate condominium project okay. and is was designed to allow their runoff from the parking lot um, that is behind our property uh, to flow through our property and into Lemon. I, I assume it has to do with grading from the mm. original design when it was all one condominium. Uh, there's a second one. That uh, flows to the building to the uh, from the building to the south, uh, right near where that gate is, um, and that's for um, I believe that's the roof drains, um, right right down there. So the original, if, as you could see on on the current uh, site plan, the um, stormwater is piped basically into the center of our property, and then uh, goes straight out to Lemon. Um, so what? Um, our engineers are proposing is to reroute that, maintain its capacity to allow us to build our own stormwater facilities and improve the situation on our site. Does okay. the question? I, th I think so. So we'll, then we'll receive an amended stormwater easement agreement that shows the extinguishment or alteration of that previous easement and still allow you to proceed with the building over top of it. Yes. So, okay, great. Um, and just wanted to clarify, you're taking stormwater from the downspout of an adjacent property there as well. Is that right? Is that what's happening? I, I believe the building, yeah, that's fine, Randall. Um, this adjacent building has a scupper at the top, and I believe there's two conveyance pipes down uh, on that building. So we would work to pick those up. Um, currently, it comes down and transmits through our property. So we would reroute those into a new um, inlet junction box here with a solid lid and then that begins to pipe around and we've sized and looked at um, the pipe sizing and the various storm events as it relates to that off-site building as well for the design of that uh, conveyance piping system that runs through our site in a different location but conveys the same the same stormwater and and whatnot as is currently there. Got it. Thank you. And then my last, uh, I just have one final comment. And um, I would encourage you to, and I think I mentioned this at the Historical Commission, to um, just look at the storefronts along 300 block of North Queen Street and look at the um, how wide each of the storefronts are. One of the intriguing and fun things about this street is that there's storefronts every 10 steps. And that kind of um, uh, 
sort of constant opportunity for something new to interact with is what makes this a really engaging street. And I think that the commercial unit that you have offered um, I, at the corner could probably benefit from being a smaller unit. Uh, a lot of, you know, small, like newer retail, especially local retails are looking, they're looking for more affordable spaces. So the smaller um, sized unit could potentially, uh, you know, benefit that too. But certainly I'm no expert in retail, uh, commercial retail. So just a suggestion um, from a planning standpoint. Um, and then uh, the fitness center, it says commercial fitness. Is that open to the public or is that just for uh, tenants of the building? That will be a tenant amenity. Tenant amenity. Okay. Oh. Um, so all the more reason then maybe to split that commercial space. Uh, if the public is not going to be coming and going from that space, it's really just an opportunity for the public to watch the tenants exercise, which is a little bit less exciting for the general public uh, and not as much an engaging um, use. Um, so, okay, I think that concludes my questions for now, but uh, any other commission questions? I'd like to know um, uh, the vision for your project and what your target demographic is, please. I could speak to the second. I, I would probably uh, prefer if you could clarify the first question. The, the vision of this project, what, what are you, you know, at the end of the day when you complete this project, what, what are you ultimately trying to serve? What, how is this going to enhance this particular area of our community and and what do you see happening within this particular building sure so um, the city of lancaster has a severe housing shortage especially for smaller units if you will um, if, you, if you look at market research for, for this area you'll see that rents probably climbed 15 to 20 percent last year year over year that's because there's no new supply coming online and there's increased demand there's increased demand because you have such a great city. So one of the things that we want to do is to provide housing at a, uh, uh, a decent price point. That Do you have uh, any idea what those price points are? Well, we're, we're talking a couple of years in the future, so it's, it's a little difficult to say. But So but you would be working out some of those numbers now with the uh, working with we, the metrics well, in the what background? What I can say for, for sure is um, we would expect to be in line with other projects that are already up and running in town. So um, this is not going to be the most expensive building to rent in in the city. Your, um, your average renter here will probably be one person living in an apartment, maybe two. They will be making somewhere between forty-five and $80,000 a year, uh, depending on which unit they select. So this is not for millionaires. This is not affordable housing. It is for the middle of the city, um, and it will be bringing life to to downtown or adding life to to to, a, to downtown, bringing people to a vi a very vibrant block, um, and um, they will probably you know be people who are um, professional. They could be. Uh, city employees, they could be um, young attorneys, they could be mm -hmm. nurses at the hospital, they could be, um, I, I would assume a, a, any anyone like that could be could be renting at a building like this at those price points. So I, I understand and I, I do uh, appreciate the fact that we there is a shortage of smaller units um, for younger professionals getting started. Um, when we have that, there's a high turnover of you know of units within those particular buildings i would love to see something i mean we are a growing city and a glorious city right and and we're also a family city you know i'd like to see some mix of units in here and i would love to see something that could accommodate you know a mom a dad and a child or two um you know something along those building or something along those lines you know um and then i also would challenge you to think you know of, of seven stories in that particular neighborhood is gigantic and let's just say 72 units if you have two people per unit you're looking at about let's just guess and say we're about 125 people maybe live in this building 18 parking spaces um, it, it, that's a lot it's just a lot in that particular area so I want you to think about how that's going to impact the other people that have lived there and, and will live there for you know for years to come um, I, I think that an apartment and um, some housing units on that particular parcel is a fantastic use of space I question the size of it 
Um, and then uh, the other question that I would also have is that first floor commercial space at the gym. I would sure. recommend that be something more those. public. Let me address those because you've mm -hmm. mentioned maybe seven sure. different points there. Um, first, um, in terms of unit sizing, um, you actually have a lot of larger units in this town. They're in the form of townhouses. And so what you have right now is you have people who are forced to pay up for a townhouse to rent who probably only need one bedroom at this time of their life where they have to find roommates. So you're having a mismatch of, of renters to product right now because there are not enough smaller units in so. There are buildings that, new construction buildings that have two bedrooms and three bedroom units. And they're sitting on the market right now, currently unrented in a time where rents are climbing and everything is being rented. I want to jump in. Um, so I agree with Ms. Sufert's uh, desire for more mixed use, like mixed type of housing. Uh, and I understand that there is a mismatch between products and the consumer. Um, but moving is sometimes one of the most, if not, uh, is a consistently expensive cost for people as they go through their housing products in their lifetime. And for someone or for, let's just say someone moves in here as an individual, um, it would be ideal for them to be able to relocate within the same building and be rooted in their community right. as opposed to needing to bounce around. So I'm not saying that there isn't a shortage of the single uh, bedrooms and studios, uh, and I like seeing the volume of that, but I do think that there could be a fusion of some of these units on floors. Can I, can I address that for a second? I, I've run hundreds and hundreds of units. I've seen transfers within the building maybe four or five times. It's very, very uncommon. When people move, they move for space, they don't usually move from a one bed to a two bed, they move from a one bed to a small house, or this, a studio to a two bed. They're not they're not moving within the same building. I, I just don't see it. When in, in, from my from my experience renting the apartments, uh, it's it's very uncommon. I think the Lancaster City Market specifically has a big need for family. Um, I, I'm going to use the word affordable, but not affordable from a financed, um, HUD financed or subsidized fashion, uh, but we need some reasonably priced um, apartment opportunities that provide low maintenance uh, for families who, you know, whether they choose to live there for three years or five years or ten years or call that home for the rest of their lives, I think having those, if you just, I, I'd love to see it's, what you could think about. It's not viable, so... It's, I, I'll, I can tell you right right now. Mr. I, Richards, do you mind if I, I just jump yes. in for one moment? Um, just a, a couple of uh, sort of um, guidelines for, for uh, us. Um, we do not have purview, unfortunately, over bedroom count uh, within units. Um, certainly the Planning Commission can explore that and zoning. Um, I think the, the city has not taken that approach in the past just to allow developers to respond to market conditions because at the end of the day, of course, they need these units to be rented as well. Right. Um, we have conducted two housing studies that have identified uh, a huge shortage of, of single units. Mm -hmm. And part of... Um, so developers are also responding to that information that they've gathered and that the city's gathered with two different consultants. And um, part of the pressure for families is exactly what, what Mr. Richards said. Many of the townhomes that are occupied are single person families, according to the uh, US Census. So providing more of these units for newcomers or for people in our community certainly does um, create a little bit more slack ideally in the the market for family sized units which are these two and three and four bedroom homes that we're fortunate to have in the, in the city um, more anecdotal and anecdotally um, one of the new construction projects that did include a subset of two bedroom units uh, about 104 um, uh, single units oh, sorry there were 104 total units and about 80 percent of them were single uh, single units the slowest to lease, uh, and it took about maybe almost a full year to, to lease the final units, were all two-bedroom units. And so uh, that was even pre-COVID that those came on. So it, we had a very, very strong market here. You know, there were no inhibitions about moving. Um, so we know from, from that as well that the new units just um, 
are challenging. Now that said, there still may be a need for more affordable, affordably priced family units. And that, that is an area that's I think worthy of more exploration or housing and secure families and, and I think other subsets. Um, but if I may just direct the commission's attention back to um, just more of the land development topics only for the sake of the public to also be able to weigh in and we still have a, a little bit more business uh, to get to this evening. So I have a question. Um, two th well, two things. Has the visibility of the entrance and exit been considered? I mean, Lemon Street is a small street. There's a small alley next to it. And you're saying that this is a narrow entry and exit. Has visibility been considered? Especially with two trees right next to it? Mm -hmm. The trees are shifting um, to the side. I think I, I spoke to that earlier. You did. So we will be uh, complying with that. But we have looked at uh, the site distances and measured that. And uh, we do have adequate. Um, adequate location for visibility on okay. on those areas. Um, I would note that um, one other item, and I know Gary touched on, um, the parking inside will not truly itself be visible from the street. Um, that was a review comment. Um, so this is this will feel like building facade either through screening. Uh, on the building facade itself, but that was evident in the um, some of the elevations that were shared from the architectural plan. So this plan looks very deceiving because of the way the parking is depicted there, mm -hmm. but there is essentially the facade along that front edge and a roll, uh, garage door closure mm -hmm. um, that's being looked at carefully in design. Um, that will be automated for the for the residents um, up and down as they they come and go but we have looked at site distance site distance mm -hmm. okay and then the other thing is is there are there any ideas for the commercial space since what looked like um, a community use fitness center and um, finding out that it's an amenity for the residents now there's only this one commercial space any ideas for what that might be to an extent, it depends on what retail tenants um, seek to rent the space. Um, we don't uh, we don't choose the tenant necessarily; they choose us. Um, we are open to any host of tenancies, and um, if if you know someone, you want to put someone in there, happy to talk about it. We have no idea right now. Okay. To know that you're open to anything is interesting, but thank you. Douglas, I'd like to make no, a comment. No, oh, okay. that's good. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. I think we're, for the whole, you know, uh, rental unit size debate, market, affordable, all that kind of stuff, um, I just want to note that I think we're throwing all this stuff around. I haven't seen any kind of a formalized study of what's actually needed in the city. Is that something that's even available somewhere? So we can see like affordable first, like affordable one room or whatever. Yeah, market for, rate one for housing. Rooms, affordable, bigger house, you know. Basically cross tabs of affordable yeah. market, high end that yeah. are really in demand in the city. Definitely. Uh, I, I can arrange a presentation uh, for the commission of our two uh, affordability studies that we've done or their, their housing studies. And, uh, you know, they, they look at a variety of different factors, family size. Um, uh, they look at housing stock throughout the city and different census tracts, uh, what's existing, uh, as well as vacancy and rental rates. Um, you know, we have very, very low vacancy rates in the city compared to most. I mean, it's an unhealthy uh, low level of vacancy. And in other words, all of the housing is taken. Um, the amount of turnover that's happening is, uh, is very minimal and doesn't provide a lot of opportunity for people to find opportunities, which of course increases the, the price of housing. So um, that housing, I'm happy to arrange that. I mean, just a couple of the highlights, the mismatch that Mr. Richards mentioned is definitely one of the biggest takeaways from that study. The other one is just the supply. Uh, I think it was estimated that somewhere around 2,500 units um, were needed to meet the um, the demand that, that's there to get the vacancy rate to a more uh, reasonable amount. And really that housing is um, 
there are certain income bands that where it's needed, but there's also the need to just create slack in the market so that there can be price adjustment um, over time. So, uh, you know, any and to some degree, any units are good units, to be honest, as long as they're they're filled. Um, but certainly workforce housing or middle market housing is uh, is really advantageous, I think, to the city. Um, it's needed at all price points. So I will follow up with you on that. I will set up a time for the Planning Commission to meet and uh, get a review of that information. And I'm happy to send an email in advance if uh, folks want to take a look at the studies. I would just like to add also that um, you have such a shortage of housing supply here, and it may not it may not be totally apparent to you if you're not in the rental market, but uh, apartments are leasing um, somewhere between 75 and 100 days prior to lease when, when a notice is given. Um, and uh, that's not a normal market condition. That is the result of a severe supply shortage. Most apartments in this country rent 45 days in advance of it vacating. So you have people clamoring for apartments right now in this price point. It, there's a there's a, a real demand for it because people need it. Um, and I did a quick calculation. You said forty five thousand, eighty thousand a year is roughly the income of somebody living in one of these apartments. Depending on which unit. So at a twenty five percent of an annual salary, that'd be between about a thousand and sixteen hundred dollars a month. Do you think that's about right? I think the uh, the national uh, rule is is one third. It would be thirty three percent, but. Um, somewhere it'll be with a one in the front if that's what you're asking yes. so I mean I'm doing the math in my head so between thirteen hundred and two thousand dollars a month then yeah. yeah okay I mean as of today I you know I don't know what yeah yeah um so more more questions some comments um why were the stair why were the stairs put where they were, uh, specifically the southmost stair stairs? Why, um, so the question is about the organization? Yeah, and, yeah, like feel free to speak more openly about the whole building. I want to say I actually enjoy the fact that the elevator has been placed pretty centrally, um, but th the reason why I'm asking about the stairs um, is actually because I have, look, personally, I think that having multiple sides of a unit, which I see you did, and I appreciate the setback to include lighting in those other apartments that gives them two walls of light. Um, but the reason why I ask about where the stairs were located is because if there's potential to reorient them and potentially use them to increase natural lighting access to more units, I think that's appealing and would increase the value of the apartments. Yeah, so I can speak to uh a couple of the organizational issues. Obviously, we have the ground floor plan. Maybe we start with the ground floor plan, then we'll come back to this plan. But on the ground floor plan, you can see we have the main residential entrance from the street is really here. Um, it makes a lot of sense to get this central core pretty much right in the center of the building as much as we possibly can. And um, this stair tower we got down in here um, because we have to have a certain distance between the stair towers mm -hmm. uh, and there's issues of dead ends and that sort of thing. When we go up to the second or upper floors, we can kind of talk through that. Um, we have everything set up so that essentially the corridor comes down through the center. It's double loaded with units on either side. And so each unit obviously has the entrance side here and then obviously the outside and the windows to the exterior. We did, um, as we talked about earlier, we did notch out this corner so that we could get windows in this unit um, and also additional windows in this unit. We at one point had a stair tower out here, which of course takes away from the parking on the first floor. And so we were trying to keep the stair towers out of the parking footprint, which is why this one got shifted in. Um, there's a limitation on dead ends, which is pretty much what established this location in relationship to this corridor. And so that's how that was kind of set up. Um, and the stair tower at this end was the most remote location to get those exits as far apart from each other. Okay. We, did, we are showing a little notch down in here. Yes. And that, that again is to get natural light into the circulation areas as we go up through the building. Um, yeah, if there's, if there's any way, 
So generally speaking, not just relevant to the stairs, but if there's any way to um, create more natural light, even if it is through unconventional means, such as uh, creating additional spaces, that would be interesting to see and I think would be fairly novel for recent development um, to see different architectural manners of creating spaces for light. Um, just a, another comment on that. I mean, we've worked on a handful of multi-unit housing projects like this recently in Lancaster and in other uh, central PA cities. Um, many of them are a similar footprint where you have a certain width that makes the most sense for a one bedroom or for a studio. Um, these units are set up where we have a good floor to floor height and so we have good height in each of the units. And at the end of each one of these, you can see, so here's a unit that's about 18 feet wide, and we've got three windows that are approximately 12 feet overall and about eight feet tall. And so there's very large windows in these units. And so the natural light um, for these units has been something that was kind of dictated right at the front end. To me. Since gotcha. they're relatively small units, we want them to feel spatial, you know, feel spatially larger and have good natural light. Okay, good. Um, then this is more of a, a comment, and the, don't no, please no one take this too personally, but this is more of a philosophy I have, generally speaking. Uh, I also find frustration, uh, if that's the sentiment carried forward, uh, I find frustration with amenities that are exclusive for residents of a, of a building because I think that those are opportunities to increase the amount of connections people make within their community. Uh, so that that gym space on the bottom is frustrating to, to know it's intended exclusively for the tenants of the building. Because um, sometimes those those spaces go underutilized by the tenants themselves. Like, And people may still feel inclined to go and get a gym membership elsewhere. So um, just as a, a comment, like that's not... Um, necessarily a uh, design or a operational choice that sparks delight within me. Uh, yeah. I have uh, three more, I think, rather quick questions. Can you tell me exactly how emergency vehicles will enter and exit or how that will work? I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand how that flow of traffic will happen. And while you're on the emergency vehicles, I'm also wondering about trash traffic as well. Yep. So let's talk about emergency vehicles. I think that we do not really expect that emergency vehicles will be coming into our site for any emergency issues for our site. We think the only reason emergency vehicle will be coming into the site is to get to the site behind us. And so what we're proposing is we're proposing essentially a fire lane that's here this opening here meets the requirements of the fire code to get their largest piece of equipment into the site from here and get to this point at the back of the site, either going through this gate or not going through this gate, but providing access to this area that's over here, which is our understanding of what the emergency easement, emergency access easement was about. When we went to the fire bureau to sort through that, no one really understood why that easement was established in the first place, but they did say, oh, that would work if we need to get a, um, an aerial apparatus vehicle into the site behind. Okay, trash. Let's talk about trash. So on, let's go to the upper floor. Well, just one second. So you're telling me that you don't anticipate your electrical room will ever be on fire? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm just <laughs> I suppose that's a possibility. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they'll, okay. they'll access it from the street. I okay. Mean, yeah. I mean, I think quite honestly, for this building, if you were fighting a fire in this building, you're probably going to want to be here or here, as opposed to here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah. I don't know if you can pull up these plans or not. I don't know if you can pull up the plan that I'm looking at here. Um, the, if I'm understanding correctly, your emergency vehicles are going to enter and exit through the, the essentially the garage. Through the garage, that's correct. And that's yeah. uh, this is an enclosed building space. It is an enclosed. That's it, open it, in the back. It's, so the parking is at the first floor level, and there's no other construction in this area on the first floor. Everything is 
The second floor above this is 16 feet above this. And so the opening at this location is 13.6, which is the required height that's required to get the largest piece of equipment that the fire department has into that space. Okay. And I do okay. have to say, originally, the floor-to-floor -floor height was more like 14 feet. We had some discussion about the height of the building. I think we wanted some additional height. And when we had the discussions with the fire department, um, they said that what they really needed was 13 and a half feet um, to get, you know, that's what the fire code requires for the aero apparatus. Okay, so interesting. How okay. about the uh, d uh, trash? How will trash, trash be yes. collected? So, uh, let's start on the upper floors, and I can kind of take you through how trash, we think trash is going to be handled. Right now in the center of the building, we have this center core, stair tower, elevator, mechanical room, janitor's closet. We have a trash chute right here, and... Um, Recycling that's here. This is getting rearranged somewhat where all this stuff is moving into an enclosed room But it will be in this general location and so every tenant can take their trash to trash chute at this location Or get their recyclables at this point the Recyclables will have to be handled by building management where the recyclables get taken down the elevator on a certain schedule And so if we go back down to the first floor uh, That ends up down in this location right here and we're expecting to have a compactor in that location and two containers. And so we'll be able to run the trash down, compact it into a container in here. The containers can be switched out. And we think that when it's um, collected, um, these containers will be rolled out and they'll be picked up from the street at this location. Typically, that's something that you negotiate with the hauler. Some haulers will come in and actually roll things out. Sometimes management rolls out the containers, but it can be done either way. Okay, thank you. I wasn't aware of that. Interesting. Um, two more questions. Uh, bikes. You noted that there was bike parking. Um, how many 72 units, um, single units? I'm thinking these are going to uh, target a younger demographic. Um, I myself like to consider myself a younger demographic, yep. and I ride my bike all yep. over this place. Um, I'm still so pretending I'm younger as well. So. Where, will, where will bike parking be located, <laughs> and approximately how many bikes do you think you'll be able to park in there? So what we're showing in this particular plan is we had the bikes in this location, so they were in the garage, they were covered. We have since moved the bikes from this location to a location in here. This is tenant storage, and so you'd be able to come in from the parking area and get to the tenant storage, or come from the lobby area and get to the tenant storage. The bikes will also be in this location. We have a minimum of 15 spaces. We may end up getting more than that, but where we're at right now is to have at least 15 parking spaces that are going to end up right in here. Okay. I, I assume that garage is all lit up as well. I mean, I, I've learned never to assume anything in my life, so I'm... I'm sorry. The garage where the folks are parking, there's a, yeah. plenty of light in there, so it's safe. Yeah. Um, last question. Parking. There's 18 spaces, you said? Um, what type of relationship do you anticipate building with the two um, parking garages? Is it one or two parking garages that are in really close proximity to this, too? Yeah, so I'm assuming that we will form some type of relationship and encourage our residents to park in those buildings or in those lots? Yes, uh, I spoke to parking authority. They were ecstatic with having more potential parking renters, uh, especially for the new garage that just went in around the corner uh, directly to the south of us. Um, and um, it's, it's not a formal agreement. They are not doing those right now, but um, they were, they welcome our residents and um, we are able to enter into um, uh, so sign leases ourselves for, for spots and rent them back to, the, to ensure availability. Do you anticipate doing that as part of your leasing agreement to encourage the residents that are going to move into this or occupy this building to Probably park in those locations? To some extent, yeah. I would, I would assume so. I have questions that I think aren't the place to ask here. Um, do you guys have like emails or like business cards so I can reach? I have I have yours. Uh, you can funnel all to me, and I will certainly get them to our design team. Douglas Mandali. Most people at the city have my email splashed everywhere, so you're more than welcome to. I have a business card I can share again with you tonight. Um, however, you would like to do that, but you're more than welcome to send them my direction and then I can funnel them to the rest of the team, no problem. Okay, I, and no disrespect to that. I actually, p 
part of why I want your email specifically is you, you have me thinking a lot about stairs right now, and I would actually love to have an external conversation about stairs. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no other comments from our commissioners, uh, may I welcome any comments from the public, please? Good evening. Um, my name is Diane Umble. I am the president of the Northgate Homeowners Association, and I'm bringing you a number of concerns we have with this project. Excuse me, Diane. I'm so yes. sorry. Uh, would you please state the block that you live on as well, your name uh, and the block that you live on? Yeah, we live on the 300 block. Thank you. Our, um, the Northgate buildings are, um, our address is Christ North Christian Street, so 336 North Christian Street is where we live. Um, I, I'll make a couple of comments and some questions and, and then maybe, I, I don't know if we'd want to take these one at a time or whether I just should speak and then uh, we can discuss. So if um, you, you'll have about three minutes and if okay. you want to um, list your questions now, we can jot them down and address them accordingly when you're finished. Okay. Thank you. So um, just to register concern about the mass and the scale of this project. Um, uh, we question the, asso the assertion that it's in keeping with the mass and scale of the 300 block of North Queen, um, and to compare mass and scale with a reference to the hospital seems like the exception rather than the rule. Um, so that's a concern. I'm especially concerned about the discussion of the easement. It is my understanding that the easement into our parking lot is because for fire and safety. And if you know Christian Street, if you know North Christian Street, it is a very narrow street. And so the concern is that we have the kind of emergency access into our parking lot that is needed. Um, and there are times when we have actually used that easement for egress, of especially, for example, the many months when um, Christian Street was closed or portions of Christian Street were closed, including the access to our entrance uh, for uh, repaving and for um, utility um, upgrades. So the easement is especially important to us um, as we go forward with uh, discussing this, uh, both for emergency access, but also for emergency egress. Um, we had a, a time this winter when our gate was frozen solid and we couldn't get out onto Christian Street. Um, and so that egress through what is now the parking lot was very important to us. I'm especially also concerned about the stormwater discussion because as I look at these plans, our stormwater runs, I think we're the off-site stormwater that they're referencing. Um, and so our stormwater um, runoff, especially from our parking lot, s appears to go into the proposed, um, the proposed stormwater plan for this building and appears to go through the building now um, because it exists currently um, as part of the um, the process. So stormwater is again a concern of ours because our stormwater flows into that access to Lemon Street. Um, and then I just f finally have a, an aesthetics question. Uh, we'll be looking at the back of this building um, and so I haven't seen necessarily any drawings of what the back of the building looks like um, and so we'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about that. So uh, does that cover Thank concerns? You. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, I was just going to say, does the uh, development team want to address the questions that she just posed? I want to make sure. Mm -hmm. uh, from a stormwater standpoint, I certainly I mean, understand. Um, that's okay. Do you have the laser pointer? No. Um, I neglected to expand even farther, <laughs> which I will for you. We're introducing a trench drain across here. 
Um, it's really difficult to see at this scale, but it's essentially just within our property, but on our side of the gate uh, of the shared property line there, that trench drain will intercept the water. We, we certainly understand and realize there's a pretty good slope coming down the driveway and understand that. And we've taken all of that into consideration um, with the way the stormwater flows uh, and the trench drains capacities to collect that stormwater that pipes into the side of this junction box as well and joins the surface flow from your site onto us, collected, piped underground, piped into this system and continues around to be mitigated and, and transported uh, through, that, through that area as well. So they have looked at all of the watershed areas of the way your, the parking lot drains and does funnel down into that space. So we certainly appreciate um, the question and, and understand that we are um, looking at that as off-site mitigation that comes down onto the site and, and are accommodating for that as well. Um, regarding a couple of the other questions, I'll take a stab at them. Um, so this, uh, this body really is only reviewing the site plan, uh, bird's eye view, two-dimensional, basically. Um, we do not get into um, the building design at all. Um, the design of the building is really driven um, by two things. Um, one is the building code that they have to construct to, um, which requires a certain number of openings and things like that. And then the other is our historical commission. Um, they regulate the building design um, based on the, the Secretary of Interior standards, um, as well as uh, other design standards in the ordinance. And generally, it requires a building follow certain rhythms and patterns of the architecture in the area, um, but may not need to adhere to uh, um, traditional material styles. In fact, generally, they encourage newer material styles. So this project was reviewed conceptually by the Historical Commission, I think a couple months ago, um, it's planning to come back. It has to come back for a final review. Um, and that would certainly be a time for you to, you know, express more concerns or, or ideas around the aesthetics of the building um, and how those should change. The massing of the building, um, they are developing by right. There's no, no additional permissions that they need uh, for height. Um, in fact, they would have the legal right to go higher and the city would uh, not be able to do anything about that. We have existing zoning laws that allow um, certain heights, and with this being in uh, one of the central business districts, um, they are permitted um, to, to build higher than, than they are right now. Um, so uh, certainly height is, is a controversial issue um, and uh, should be debated at a policy level for sure, but in terms of the, the height of this building, um, that is legally guaranteed. No problem. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to a little more to that issue, and I, I we know it's a big building. We're trying to we're trying to figure out how to modulate the materials and the scale of it to make it fit in as best as it can. It is allowed to be by zoning as much as 150 feet. We're roughly half that height. So um, the other thing that I think it's important for you to understand is this building relative to, say, the Keppel building, is probably only about 10 feet higher than the Keppel building. This building is actually no higher than the Lancaster Press building, and the Lancaster Press building is a larger footprint. And so, you know, just for comparison, there are two other buildings that are within a half a block of where we are. So just, just to kind of think about in context those issues. And, and I would say, um, the issues of materiality and discussions of how we're dealing with the elevations and so forth, that will come up before the Historic Commission again. We did um, present in April. There were a number of comments, some of which Douglas mentioned. Uh, there were issues um, regarding stepping down the scale, dealing with the uh, how we're treating the parking garage entrance and that elevation and how that addresses the streetscape. There were some discussions about the storefront. All of those things are things that we're looking at now as, we, as, the, as the plans evolve. So, and I would also say, if you have specific comments, 
um, that you want to get in front of us, I would prefer to get them before getting to historic commission. So it would be nice if you have comments and you want to share them or you want to be uh, heard on your issues, feel free to reach out to us on that. Part of what Gary, um, sorry, Mr. Weaver said is, uh, is very important too. I mean, we as a community have to work together and um, work with the developers in order to, you know, make sure that our voices are heard in their process as well, as well as their voices are heard um, and, and their reasonings are shared. So um, we would encourage you to continue to follow the process, look at the various uh, meeting minutes, everything's posted online, all the information that you need, um, and, and you can, you know, uh, follow the storyline is that way, that way as well. That way you will have a chance to participate and, and have your voices heard in, in some of the various approval processes along the way. And Madam Chair, just to that point, and uh, sir, uh, feel free to make your way up to the podium if you'd like to speak. And while you're getting there, I'll just ask, do you all know where to find our agendas and minutes online? Yeah, okay. And, and for those who may not know, maybe you can share amongst yourselves. This particular agenda um, is public, was published in LNP in the government calendar. That is not a requirement that every board and commission publish there. So I just wanted to let you know not to rely on that as a resource always to find agendas. Um, we have a website. Uh, we, we have a service called eCode that we contract with. Uh, and eCode posts, that, that is our legal repository of all of our agendas and minutes, basically. Um, agendas are typically posted five days in advance of the meeting, sometimes longer. But uh, if, if you definitely look within, you know, you can look at, at our schedules on the city website, see how often we meet. The Historical Commission meets one, once a month on third Mondays. We meet twice a month if we have agenda items. Um, but just want to make sure you have the resources to find out more about the upcoming meetings. Please, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Cassidy. I live in the Northgate community also. Uh, these are just a couple of observations that I would hope the Commission would uh, consider. If I understand the building plans correctly, the building is going to be developed and notched out uh, so that we'll have this egress uh, to Lemon Street from our parking lot. Is that correct? That it would go, uh, they're going to start developing uh, on the second floor, it'll cover that so that the fire truck can get through. My question would be, <clears throat> if the fire trucks are on Queen Street or on Lemon Street, how do they get to the back of the developed building if, they, if that back section is covered? The truck would have to pull the whole way out into our lot and then try to have enough water force to get to the building. I think that's something that should really be looked at. Uh, it's great that, they, that the developers feel that the fires would be handled by Queen and Lemon, but if it's in the back of the building, there's going to be a problem. Uh, that was one observation. Uh, another observation would be that, uh, and I'm not sure of this, I would ask the commission to uh, check this, but I believe a former business in that uh, parking lot had uh, storage tanks. I don't know if they were toxic gasoline tanks. I'm not sure what they were. I don't know if they were removed, uh, whether that uh, there's some kind of construction concerns that you should be aware of in terms of underground uh, issues. I don't know if they were removed and, and that was filled in. I, I don't know that, but I would think that, that would be something that you would be concerned about. Uh, in the issue of the 18 parking spaces, which has been uh, addressed a few times, uh, it's uh, appreciated that the developing company wants to uh, be in touch with the parking uh, authority, but the Lancaster Press Building was originally supposed to be uh, attached to the one parking garage. There were issues that uh, prevented that. Those buildings, part of the reason that they haven't uh, all sold, now maybe they are by this time, but that's been 10 years, uh, was because the people had to park their cars 
away from the, their actual uh, living area. Now you're talking about at least 50 possible cars, if there's 70, uh, a car for every spot, uh, would, would need to be parked in these uh, other garages. I don't think that's going to be a, a strong selling point or a strong rental point. In addition to that, I would suspect that some of these uh, renters will be uh, parking in uh, on Lemon Street, particularly in areas where permanent residents live. How does that you know impact on the community relationship? So I, I think those are all uh, issues that uh, the commission should be looking at. I'm hoping that uh, uh, that a reasonable approach can be uh, what met through these. But I, I am very concerned about the back of the building being on fire and no way for the fire department to uh, be able to uh, try to prevent further damage. Thank you. M Madam Chair, um, may I like j just, I guess, ask some questions, sort of? May I say no? I'm just kidding, Mr. Yo, <laughs> don't hurt my feelings. Absolutely, you may, may uh, I believe you may ask another question, unless it's out of line. Well, it's actually more for residents. I'm trying, I'm just trying to, like, come to an understanding or, like, gather some insight here. Um, uh, so this is me personally. We're going to disagree on something. Um, I am a fan of taller construction. Um, more people are moving to cities than ever before, especially as um, climate changes all throughout the planet, cities are growing um, more than any other place. And so it's not, frankly, I, I don't feel it's sustainable that cities keep building short. Um, I, I definitely understand a concern about a large building being placed beside you, but would you mind like giving me some insight as to like, is, is there, are there more specific reasons as to why height is a concern for you guys? So, sorry, Miss, do you mind approaching the podium only because we're live streaming the meeting and there may be people watching and uh, I... Yes. I live on Lemon Street and I, I'm in one of the townhouses. I have a beautiful back patio that's landscaped. We have hedges in the back. I can only imagine the impact of changing the environment for all of our landscaping. Um, that's what drew me to Northgate is the outside space in the city. So we will disagree on that because I think it's amazing to be able to live in a city with a beautifully, you can kind of see it back there, with the beautifully landscaped private outdoor space that will now be a shadow when we're used to bright light. Um, the Christian Street building, where these guys all live, they enjoy views of um, fireworks from Clipper, and they're not going to be able to see that anymore. All, of, yeah, yeah, tons of beautiful views, and it's going to be the back of the building now. Okay. Can we get your name for the record? I'm sure, sorry. it's Marianne Galt. Thank you. Thanks. Well, so maybe this is a, a question for the developer. Um, I don't know if any compromise can be made, but is it possible that residents surrounding the building could access that green roof so that maybe different views could be experienced? You know, I, I've never been asked that question before. So, um, uh, I've, I've, I've developed a, a bunch of... Um, a bunch of buildings in urban settings, and uh, I've never been asked that. Um, I could look into it. I, I don't really have an answer. I don't know what that would look like from an insurance standpoint, but um, <laughs> I, could, I could look into it. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I also appreciate that you guys are here. Like, um, public engagement 
is probably one of my biggest like MOs personally. Um, it, it could be argued that we live stream because I've been such a pest about that in the past. Uh, and so to have six of you guys here, um, when what, what city gate is it? Six condos? More than that? Ten, twelve. Even still, that's a small amount compared to like a lot of you are here in my mind. So I appreciate you coming out to to speak how you feel about the project, and uh, I do hope that some compromises may be made to maybe there are some aspects that can be encouraged that you guys would look forward to. Uh, so thank you for being here. Douglas, just to go back to one of the concerns, and I'm assuming this is true, but I just want to double check. Um, the 18 parking spaces, that meets all the current zoning requirements, and what are the minimum currently for, for uh, building? Uh, in the central business district, the minimum parking requirement is zero. That's what I thought. I just wanted to double and, check. Uh, that has actually been a long-standing policy of the cities uh, for quite some time, uh, decades, I believe, um, at least two decades. And the original thinking of eliminating parking in the downtown um, was to well, several fold, actually. One was to encourage development. Um, at one point, uh, Lancaster City was not being developed uh, nearly to what it is now. Now we have development. Now people are concerned about the development rather than concerned about the lack of development. So it, it's just a challenging thing to, to balance. Um, the second thing is uh, from a walkability standpoint and a highest and best use standpoint, you know, best planning policy, say air, urban planners and other economic developers, is to um, maximize your buildable uh, square footage in the downtown, which is your highest prize area. It's also where we have walkable commercial retail. So we really try to minimize um, parking, especially surface parking. The other thing that the city did around the same time is they established a parking authority. So instead of requiring a developer to uh, provide its parking on site, piecemeal, project by project, uh, we purchased land in the downtown and built parking garages. And that is essentially a public good that we provide to the community, to developers, to the downtown visitors um, in a more efficient way than it would be provided if each developer provided their own parking uh, piece by piece. So um, while we complain about the parking, and many people complain about the parking garages, um, it is important to remember that now they are probably more used than they ever have been before. Much of the density in the downtown has been locating adjacent to parking structures, um, which we see as, as, a, as sort of a perfect match um, in many ways. Um, so I, I certainly understand the parking, the reality of parking pressures uh, in the city, and we are going through a comprehensive planning process right now uh, in, in the city. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, I encourage you to look up uh, engagelancaster.com. Is anyone familiar with that outreach platform? Okay. So we have a survey on there right now that asks specifically about building typologies, height, types of buildings, uses in buildings. Um, we are using this data that we're getting from the public to create uh, our comprehensive plan, which will be the foundation for future land use planning in the city. So that will determine what our next zoning rewrite looks like, how much height we allow, how much parking we may be requiring. So uh, I highly encourage you to uh, inform yourself about that, be engaged on Engage Lancaster. If you have questions, you can contact me directly. There are ways that you can also get involved um, beyond that. Uh, we, are, we are exploring this issue uh, carefully now, and we hope to adopt that plan sometime in um, um, early summer of next year. Does this is the most robust. So, oh, sorry. I was just going to say this is the most robust discussion we've had on a sketch plan. I, I think uh, maybe next to the hospital redevelopment rezoning. But yeah, um, let's go. Thank you. I just wondered, um, considering that Douglas, what you're saying about the uh, the whole restructuring and the contributions from the community of how we want our city to look. I wondered if developers even consider that. Um, and I don't know to what extent um, there was already public opinion about the height of this building um, with it just being a sketch plan. What were public comments already considered? I 
think I can speak to that by saying the discussion of height and scale and mass was discussed at the Historical Commission as well, which is probably the logical place to have that discussion. It, but, I'm sure it'll be discussed again. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned um, heights of building and Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, but I think most of us ha have moved here to Lancaster because it is a smaller city. And we're not really trying to shoot for the big city look. We love the quaint city that we have now. Okay, um, are there any further comments from the public? All right. Well then I'd like to thank the team at 347 North Queen Street for coming in and giving us a presentation this morning or this, after, what, or this evening. What time of day is it? It is the evening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, moving on in the agenda, <clears throat> um, item number four, the redevelopment authority of the city of Lancaster. Um, we're going to first start with the um, certification of blight for 538 Southeast Avenue. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, so this property um, has been vacant for uh, quite some time. Um, this is a property that was fire damaged in uh, 2018 and uh, was condemned by the city. Um, Sorry, I'll just uh, I'll give everyone a moment to uh, exit the room and for conversations. We'll have to continue our meeting. Yeah. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Have a good evening, Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Um, so this was a fire damaged property. I I do have um, some pictures here. If you're interested in seeing, I can maybe pass this folder down the lane here. Um, so when COVID hit, of course, it interrupted. Oh, we have pictures. Thank you, Mendeli. Um, this interrupted our inspections, and so there was quite a delay in terms of getting this property um, finally uh, to this point of certified certification of blight. Uh, it's had several owners. No one has done anything. And most recently, since February, we've heard nothing from the current owner in terms of rehabbing the property, um, despite calls and certified letters, which are uh, documented in, in the packet that I have here. Um, I hate to stop you, but what's taking so long? These are almost four years old, these pictures. Yes, they are. <laughs> and um, since then, uh, unfortunately, no building permits have been pulled, um, is what I've, I've read in, in this packet here. Um, so uh, it couldn't have gotten any better. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, without proper building permits and a certificate of occupancy, it still remains uh, a condemned um, and yeah, condemned structure. So, could I just move to certify this for blight? Certainly, as your uh, right. I second that. <laughs> uh, take a vote. Uh, I'll start down here at the end. Uh, Mr. Drasta, I'm sorry. Let me back up for one second here. Um, Should we wait and do both of them yeah, at the we, same time? Well, we can. Let me, if you'd like to do that, I can discuss okay. the next property as well. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. So, most of you probably know this next building. Um, this is uh, at the corner of North Mary and, uh, sorry, um, Walnut Street. Mm -hmm. And this has been vacant for more than a decade, I believe. Um, there was a developer that for many years tried to do something with this building. Uh, the, the person who owns it or is involved in the limited partnership um, is a, a wanted criminal, has a very large outstanding bill with the city of over $100,000, maybe over $200,000 by court mandate. Um, there is a warrant out for his arrest and uh, unfortunately has not been moving this property forward. Um, we've had repeated inspections of the property and um, it has failed to, uh, it has become blighted um, by our assessment, by the city's assessment. So um, we, no building permit has been uh, pulled recently. The, the only building permit that uh, looks like has been pulled in recent um, years was a slate roof repair, um, but 
the uh, building is vacant. It has interior demolition. Um, it's not habitable. Um, there also, there's been a broken window. Most of the windows are now um, covered up. Uh, and it has been there for a very long time like this. So this is the GR Richards or GE, GR Richards building. Um, so we're recommending this one for certification of blight two. Um, if, and just to keep you, uh, kind of remind you about where this goes from here, these properties move to the redevelopment authority uh, for consideration of eminent domain. Um, Again, formal notice has to be given to the property owner to let them know where things stand. I think a second notice is sent, and then the redevelopment authority could decide to act on the property. They have to pay fair uh, market value to the landowner at that point, and then the redevelopment authority would be responsible for disposing of the property. Um, they have affordability uh, restrictions on all of the properties that go through um, the authority, so this would likely um, go to one of our many community partners for affordable housing, probably, if it made it to that uh, phase, but it would be up to the redevelopment authority to make that uh, decision. And Douglas, at this point, we're not recommending the use once it goes through that. We're just recommending the blight. That's correct, okay. Mr. Whelan. Yeah, it would be returned to us for a recommendation of reuse. Do I have a motion to certify uh, 538 Southeast Avenue as a bladed property, as well as 502 and through 506 West Walnut Street as a certified uh, prop uh, bladed property? I would like to make the motion to certify both for blight. Um, yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we'll take a vote. Mr. Whalen? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Uh, Mr. Baum? Aye. Mr. Drasta? It, uh, aye. Okay, motion carries. Both uh, 538 Southeast Avenue and 502-506 West Walnut Street um, are uh, recommended to be certified as bladed properties. Discussion? Any discussion? Uh, the only question I have is, do we know when, because the, the Walnut Street property has been on my mind for a long time, and I'm glad to hear that it's possibly going to be affordable housing. Uh, do we know when it will show up? at the redevelopment authority? Sorry, Mike. H who would show up? Uh, no, um, like do we know when the... Oh, Walnut when Street... these pro properties would go to redevelopment authority? Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly. I would have to double check. The next scheduled meeting is the third week of September, so it would be the day before a planning commission meeting. Um, that's the next uh, scheduled meeting, day before our second planning commission meeting of the month. Um, I don't know whether we have to send out the notices and make sure that they're delivered and advertised before they actually hear the properties or not. Um, I'm sure that an update will be provided at that next meeting to let them know that these properties are headed that way, but um, sorry, I don't know the date of discussion uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving along in the agenda, is there anything um, from the housing subcommittee? Um, well, I think I'm becoming the housing subcommittee. Um, is anyone on the housing subcommittee here? I believe that it was Jocelyn and, okay, and Ms. Cook. And I think, um, was there another, a third member that was, or was it just the two of you? Ms. Cook is now the chair of that committee. Um, okay. And, and since I'm, I'm in charge here, I can so deem you that, right? <laughs> um, well, I'll just say I'm, I'm happy to uh, have a discussion, uh, Ms. Cook, on, uh, on the side to just hear more about what maybe I can do to help assist with the committee. Um, my first step will, uh, I already have distributed those uh, housing studies to you, mm -hmm. and uh, I will be shortly sending an email to our consultant asking them to attend a meeting to present that information to you as well. So maybe we can take that as a next step, buys us a little time to regroup. That's great. That's what I had written down as sure. next steps. Perfect. Okay, moving along then, how about um, item number six, our comprehensive plan update? Um, so uh, the other thing I'm going to ask is that our consultant come and present just an update on where we're at in the comprehensive planning process uh, for you all. Um, I know it's a, a slow moving beast and it's kind of hard to keep your eye on it uh, when, when so much is going on. Um, 
really what this is supposed to be during this time is our land use exercise for the downtown quadrant. Um, our meeting has gone much longer than I anticipated us going, and uh, I don't want to ask more of the commission than you can give. So uh, I'll offer it back to you as to whether you want to complete this exercise tonight or whether we should defer to another meeting when we have more energy. So I would I would recommend that we defer to another meeting when we have more brain power and energy left over. Um, okay. Do we have time to delay? I concur. Time to. As far as the comprehensive plan, this isn't going to set us back or anything. Um, I don't think so. Um, we are not close to having a draft land use map yet, so I don't think that this is of pressing importance tonight. Although I do think we should do it at the next meeting, and the next meeting. Um, may actually be quite busy as well. September 7th. Yeah, September 7th, we're anticipating uh, HDC 213 College Ave, um, which will likely uh, be a well attended meeting. And we're also anticipating uh, oh, two more uh, certifications of blight. And is uh, Redmond's ready or? Probably not, but we also have um, two t micro cottages on Sunnyside that are being proposed for land development, and there's a decision to be made there on that application. Yeah, for modifications. Um, any, anything else that you can think of? Okay. I think you, you, you mentioned most of okay. I think I think that's most of the upcoming agenda, and maybe I should get into the habit of letting you know what's coming up at the next meeting, just so you can keep tabs on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we can certainly defer that exercise, just keeping in mind that um, a lot of our meetings are very busy ahead of us. But that's okay. That's all right. Um, the other alternative is we could do this as a homework exercise. And if you wanted to submit your notes to me uh, over email, you're certainly welcome to do that too. I know we all benefit from the group discussion, but that's just another way we could do this. So, Mr. Smith, are we able to do this um, as a group outside? If, if we would, off the meeting, it's not on the meeting. Um, so are we able to come together as a group? Like I remember. <laughs> Yeah. So we technically didn't end the meeting. Uh, we continued the meeting, and and I, I would have to ask our lawyer for an opinion on this because m my um, conservative interpretation is that this is related to the business of the planning commission, since you'll be adopting the uh, the, the the yeah the. the Comprehensive plan. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied because it's getting. I've been working for too long. So we have um, to have an official meeting and notify yeah. the public and et cetera. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and we could schedule a special meeting, and we would have to advertise that meeting accordingly. That is something we can do, and we could set a particular night and then do take care of other business at that time. And I, I just, we already meet twice a month. I sort of hate to ask a third meeting of us all in, in a month. We, we certainly can. Uh, any thoughts on whether you'd prefer that we do this on September 7th or homework assignment or by special meeting? So my only thought with this one is that with the downtown quadrant, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of passion and a lot of excitement. And I think it's gonna drive a really um, robust discussion. Uh, so that, that's my only concern if we, you know, I want to allow the time and the thought to um, percolate amongst all of us as a group, um, but also be mindful of everybody's time. So I'll defer to see what others think as far as an, an additional meeting, maybe just to cover that, um, or if we want to just, you know, plan for next month or next, uh, the, in two weeks from now that we know we're just going to move in for a couple hours. Um, so I think that the downtown quadrant should definitely be at one of our regular meetings, I feel, because like I agree with you that it's going to be the most impassioned of the sections we do. But uh, I know we've been kind of on the fence about whether to do the annexes or not. I personally wouldn't mind like a subcommittee or a, a special meeting to handle the annexes in one swoop um, or a couple swoops, because uh, I do think that our input is super valuable for these. One of the things I would love to see, and if we can, or at least help me, keep a little bit of a laser focus on what the purview of the Planning Commission is when we're entertaining questions, because 
my concern is we do eat up a lot of time with things that um, aren't our questions to be asking or answering. And uh, I'm not I'm not sure how to because I'm very guilty of it myself. I will ask a question that is definitely historic commission or definitely traffic commission or something along that line. And ultimately everything does still come through us before it hits the city council or before it hits the final stages. So we are key. We can't just write off responsibilities as, oh, that's a historic commission. We don't want to hear you. But that is hard because as soon as we listen to some of the things or we then weigh in, it's like, yeah, that is a little tall, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't us to say it. And I get concerned about not legalities of it, but just where we're at by answering or even weighing in on things that we shouldn't. So I would love some help on that. Just kind of thinking about the time that we use today and in general. Yeah, uh, Mr. Whelan, I, re I really appreciate the comment. I, I'm always empathetic to concerns that are voiced here, regardless of whether they're in our purview or not. Um, however, you know, we we it, it is incumbent upon us to remain credible by adhering to our legal charge and implementing that duty. And um, I know I can I feel like I can be a bit of a nag sometimes around that. Um, but I, I really am trying to protect that credibility and your legal uh, you know, vulnerability. I mean, if we make decisions here that are outside the bounds of our charge, that is, you know, planning commission is, is um, vulnerable, legally vulnerable in that situation. Um, there are definitely policy issues that we can set time aside for, and we can make recommendations for zoning amendments, land development amendments. Certainly the comp plan is a big one. You guys are going to have a, an extremely like important duty in recommending a comp plan and reviewing that. So we'll get some presentations lined up. Um, these next uh, nine, eight, nine months are very important for the planning commission. So I, I really want to start um, building you more into that process. Um, recommending a future land use map will set the course of our zoning height all kinds of different things uh, in a broad sense, but still very important one because um, ultimately our zoning code has to adhere to our comp plan. So there's there's a legal requirement that those two documents work in concert together. Uh, so yeah, I think it's um, it's hearing hearing those uh, comments. My suggestion would be you know reminding ourselves and them of our legal purview. And then for us, our duty is to keep those comments in mind and set aside time for policy discussion, um, which it's hard to make time, isn't it? When, when we're all so busy at these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I mean, I, I, I do believe that we should consider some type of policy discussion regarding building height and parking in the central business district and how that continues to how that continues to um, grow and evolve as our community continues to grow and evolve along with it. Um, so I, I, that would be a discussion I would be interested in having. However, I do think it's a little bit premature as, as I think some of that will naturally um, roll itself out as we get further in along with this uh, comprehensive plan. Yeah. So. Thank you. And uh, sincerely appreciate all of your interest in these matters of development. It's, uh, it is a pleasure to work with a planning commission that is engaged on those topics. So thank you. So did we decide what we're going to do regarding the land use exercise? Are we going to jump in? Or are we going to table that for the next meeting? Or do we want to have a second meeting? Well, I would like to ask Douglas if, we, if there is any other, if there are any any documents that we can take into consideration as kind of homework for planning in the next meeting to review this or? Yeah, in particular regarding the downtown, uh, yes. Um, let me give some thought to that. Certainly the the housing issue, but let me, let me give some thought to that and I'll get back to you. Okay. Um, I'll send you something. Okay, thank okay. you. Sure. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to table the land use exercise for uh, a future meeting, and we're going to move on to other business, um, the election of the new chairperson for the Planning Commission. Um, do we want to have that discussion tonight, or do we want to table that until we have a couple more of our Planning Commission members here to support and I would like to make a motion to us. table that for the next meeting when we have at least our vice chair here <laughs> to be part of that. Okay. 
All right, uh, there is no um, public here to um, add in the participation. So with that being said, I will call the meeting um, to a close at 8.05 uh, p.m.